Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Legal Lab. Today, our special guest is Shayan Edelati. Shayan graduated from Harvard Law School and is an experienced legal tech consultant with a specialty in automation and AI. How are you doing today, Shayan? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. We're so excited to have you here. Is there anything I missed in the introduction? Anything you want to add about yourself that people should know? Uh, no, it's pretty thorough. Perfect. So I want to start by talking about how Cheyenne and I met and why I wanted to bring him onto the podcast. So we actually met back at the ABA Tech Show 2022, a couple months back. Um, Cheyenne was helping out in the booth next to ours, um, working with a legal tech company that specializes in AI. So we started chatting. He talked about going to school in Boston. Um, was very humble, didn't mention which school he went to until I asked him, you know, why did you decide to go to school in Boston? And then very humbly said, oh, I wanted to go to Harvard Law School. So that was pretty interesting. And I thought who better to come on and talk about getting through law school successfully than someone who graduated from Harvard Law. So Cheyenne, talk, let's talk about Harvard Law. How was your experience? What was your favorite thing, your least favorite thing? I'd love to know a little bit more about how that went for you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first off, thanks for dropping the H-bomb. Uh, <laughs> my mother does that too, humbly. Just like My son went to Harvard. How can but you anyway. not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Uh, I, I get it. So uh, law school, where should I start? What do you want to know? So your favorite thing, let's start with that. And then let's go into your least favorite thing. Um, my favorite thing. I do mention this like uh, uh, to people when they ask me this. And sometimes they're a bit surprised. Sometimes they're not. But actually, my favorite thing was the people, especially my like student, like the fellow students there. Mm-hmm. Um, I really enjoyed that part of it. Uh, and people typically say like law school is extremely competitive and it's like very impersonal. Yeah. That is true to a certain extent. It's, it is true. Um, but if you can like see through the competition, um, it, it could actually be quite fun. And I was in a various classes, obviously with people around me are highly capable. Exactly. Uh, that's why they're there. Uh, so it was always good to be around people that are very driven, goal oriented. And it was very motivating for me at the same time, especially in like Harvard, it's like a big law school. I think yeah. all through all the different years in the outland, there's like over a thousand students at any given time there. Wow. So you're like rubbing shoulders with people with different pasts or different like educational experiences and different career trajectories. So it's very illuminating as well. Um, aside from that, there was ample opportunities for fun, like weekly bar reviews, which is actually just another way to oh, say like bar so hopping cool. night. <laughs> That's really what it was. Uh, various parties, social mixers, um, and that 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 I really liked. It really opened my mind. Uh, especially in regard to like career trajectories mm-hmm. and as well as like other extracurricular things I could do and hobbies I could do. Did you feel like everyone was helping one another? It wasn't like every man for himself, like let me, you know, make sure I am good and nobody else is as good as me. Or was everyone kind of like helping each other out very kind and like, you know, let's get through this together and we're kind of a team. What was that environment like? Uh Realistically, somewhere in between those. Like there was moments where you did sense the competition. Um, But I think at least at Harvard, the administration has done certain things over the last like few years uh, to tone down that competitive nature of the law school. And it has worked to a certain extent. Uh, So we have like a pass fail grading system. Um, Because of that, grades are not as important. And if I were to give my transcript to someone, they might not be able to make sense of it much. Because there's no like A's or percentages, not like A's or B's or percentages. So that kind of helped to mellow things down. Mm-hmm. Um, there were definitely cases where there was a sense of camaraderie and we're trying to help each other out. But I would say like sometimes there wasn't. And the reality is it's because people are stressed. They're just like in their textbooks. It's not like they want to compete okay. with you. It's not like they don't want to help you. It's just like they're, they're just so trying stressed to get and they don't have time. <laughs> exactly. They don't have that much time. So there's a mixture of both. But I would say as law schools go, it's actually a relatively friendly place relatively that's great to hear great news um so if you could turn back time and talk to yourself when you were about to start law school what would you tell yourself what advice would you give to you starting law school at harvard and how to get through that uh uh, yeah i i guess a few things come to mind one of them is straight up chill like relax bro (laughs) 
uh, I was extremely like anxious and nervous applying to law school um, because like nobody else in my family had done it. I had friends who had done it, but like not applying to a place like Harvard. So I didn't know like what my odds were even. So I, I was extremely nervous. There's a lot, really, like, a, <laughs> a lot of pressure and a lot of uncertainty. And for a, almost a good year, I didn't really sleep properly just because oh of that. Uh, so like I would tell myself if I was to go back a few years, just relax. It's going to be fine. Um, going into law school, I don't know if I would do it differently, but I would let my younger self know that if you have a goal in mind at the end of that journey, mm-hmm. then set, understand what it is and go after it. Law school is three years and it's a graduate degree. People think that's like a lot of education. Like in total, that would be at least seven years that you've been in post-secondary education. Yeah. But the reality is three years passes by really quickly. And there's a lot of opportunities that you can take advantage of. There's a lot of people you can network with, a lot of fellowships and internships you could do that can really change your career trajectory when you graduate. If you have a goal in mind, like, for example, I want to be an international lawyer at well, let's just say an NGO, or I want to go into academia, or I want to be a blockchain lawyer. Actually, I don't want to do law. I want to go into management consulting. If you know that, then you can use the resources at your disposal effectively in those three years, uh, and you can get there pretty quickly. That's not the case for a lot of students. And honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I spent the first like year, year and a half exploring, okay. which was really great from giving me new perspectives and understanding about myself and what's available to me was excellent. But by the time I realized, oh, this is what I want to do, I realized that law school is almost over. And now I'm about to hit the the workforce. Um, So I wouldn't necessarily change that, but I would let my younger self know that if there is something that you have in mind or you've identified, then pursue it as effectively as possible. So what did you learn in that one year that you're talking about? You kind of went through some realizations and and had that phase. Like, what did you learn? What was enlightening? Like, what made you kind of take that shift of like, oh, like, I don't know if I want to do this. (laughs) Yeah. And a few things. So, like, I didn't do my undergrad in the U.S. Uh, I did it in Canada, which is obviously very similar to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when you go to, say, a public university, the opportunities after graduation are a bit different than in a American private Ivy League college. So I didn't have that uh, undergraduate experience that many of my uh, classmates did. So like when they graduated um, from undergrad, they got like analyst positions at investment banks, management consulting places, internships with uh, federal departments, the Congress people. So what I did after graduating undergrad was very different than what they did. And what they did obviously gave them more information about what they might want to do after law school once they get in and complete it. I really didn't have that. Uh, so here I'm in an environment where people are like, yeah, I mean, uh, once I graduate, I want to pursue an MD. I'm like, that's a thing. Do I have two graduate degrees? Or uh, <laughs> once I do this, I'm going to work at Goldman Sachs. That was not a thing uh, yeah. when I went to undergrad. I didn't have uh, friends or classmates that had those aspirations or that those resources at their disposal. So understanding that was really like helpful to see as in, these are what these people are doing. They can do it. I guess I could do it. And this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, a few people actually went into startups, which you don't typically see at many law schools, or you just don't really typically see at any school because very few of us are entrepreneurs. But I, I mean, it was great to be in that environment um, where there were some budding entrepreneurs. Uh, I didn't really have that much of that in undergrad as well. Uh, so that also enlightened me in regards to tech to blockchain, to legal tech, to startups in general. So is that when you kind of realized, oh, I enjoy legal tech and this is kind of the space I want to step into versus practicing law yourself? Yes, that, that's correct. Um, I kind of reassessed where I want to be in, say, five or 10 years. Mm-hmm. And for me, it wasn't so much um, working behind a desk trying to prepare a statement of claim or prospectus, whatever, the typical thing that either litigation or transactional lawyers do. Um, But what I really wanted to do is, what eventually I realized was more business oriented, the operations, sales strategies, business development, uh, even the innovation part. Uh, And law doesn't have that much innovation in it. It's changed. The landscape has changed a lot in the last decade. It needs to have more innovation. (laughs) It needs more. Exactly. It needs more. Um, So I realized like, that's where I want to go. I want to go into tech. Uh, and legal tech made sense because I had the legal background. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing that I guess some lawyers will notice if they want to transition out of law into something business is that people don't necessarily take them that seriously. 
because they're like, well, you have legal experience. That's different than business experience. You don't know how to sell. You don't know how to do operations. Um, so like when they do want to exit out of, say, a firm, they end up becoming in-house counsel and it takes longer than the comparable person would who hadn't gone to law school to shift over to like a business management position. Mm-hmm. Legal tech worked for me because various companies were able to take my legal experience and use it as a resource or view it as a resource. Exactly. So it was like a natural progression for me to go into legal tech as compared to other types of tech. Yeah. Having that experience in legal and in business, it's like, mm-hmm. what, what can you make with that together? Legal tech, you know, let's yeah. create something for the legal industry that's technology based and more business oriented. So you can kind of focus on that. So Going to law school is obviously very stressful and you need a good support system to get through that. So, you know, how did you do that? Do you have like any any people in your life that have influenced you, um, how they impacted you, how they helped you get through law school? Or were you kind of just on your own figuring it out? Or did you have that support system? Um, Yeah, I guess there's two parts to that question. Like what support system did I have in law school? And what like people have I had who influenced me that eventually like allowed me to go to law school. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'll like answer the first part, like when I was in law school Um, there, I had like a a pretty good network of like close friends who we could always just complain together, study together, um, just exercise together. So that was helpful. Yeah. um, And good to have them. Um. The downside is that everybody's stressed, though. Like the personality of any lawyer or law student is very type A. So even if everything's okay, there's something like stressing them out. So it was helpful <laughs> to be in amongst those people. Great to have those friends around me. At the end of the day, like it just wasn't enough because we're all stressed and I'm stressed and we're just at the end of the day, there's just stress underlining everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, having friends who were near me but not in law school was also very helpful. Okay. Those things are a bit more chill, maybe at some other graduate schools. Um, and I appreciate that. So like interacting with people who might be uh, doing like a public policy um, okay. master's or an MBA um, and other like liberal arts degrees, they have different perspectives on life. They have, they're just coming from a different background. You talk about different things. You're not always talking about trying to get like the highest grade in the con law class. That's not relevant to them. Other things are relevant. So it was a good refreshing environment to be in around those people whenever I needed to exit the law school uh, environment. Um, In terms of, I guess, who influenced me and eventually, I guess, like through their support, I wound up where I am now. Yeah. Um, How did I name three people? Um, I guess I'll start from like the first one and then go from like the most. Yeah, I'll I'll start from like one of them first. Um, So it is random, but like a dude I met in a coffee shop when I was like okay. 16. I'd love to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back in high school, I was definitely not a good, like the best student. I had like mediocre grades, sometimes not so great grades. Um, well, I didn't really fit in. Um, definitely wouldn't say I was a confident person. Uh, so I was like that kid. <laughs> I was that kid who just like might sometimes get bullied, might not, but didn't have many friends and like probably... Uh, could use a bit more confidence in his life. Um, just randomly, I had spoken with one of my classmates uh, about this guy. He said who's like a tutor who can help us on like ca- our calculus mm-hmm. assignment. I know him. He's like a family friend, but he's also a great guy to talk to. Come with me and like he'll help us uh, on this assignment. So I went to this coffee shop. I met the guy. And of course, he was much more than a tutor. Um, <laughs> I don't know what, what his background was. I don't know exactly where he got this, if he had any training at all on it. But he was a motivational speaker as well. Mm-hmm. um so like I sat down with this guy and I, he like he, it, he helped like he it clicked with me um it's very stereotypical but you, like you probably see it in like some movies and shows of that teenage boy who has issues in school and then meets this guy who becomes a mentor like kind of like Karate Kid uh, <laughs> but there yeah. was no punching or kicking <laughs> involved <laughs> so it's kind of like that and like it, it was interesting to be around him he saw something in me that I didn't realize that apparently I obviously like he thought that I had a good academic aptitude and maybe I have a good future ahead of me and he tried to really build my confidence Mm -hmm. um so that initial meeting wound up being like weekly check-ins with him at the same coffee shop too like never anywhere else um and (laughs) (laughs) I'm not gonna bring like homework with him yeah if I had a homework question I would raise it with him but I'm not gonna just talk about life Mm -hmm. life in general um so it was really great to have that person there um, he really motivated me to believe in myself. Okay. Um, and through that, like I applied to undergrad, I was 
like did well there. So like he really opened my eyes about what I'm capable of doing. The second person uh, was somebody I met in undergrad. So when I was in my first or second year, I think it was like early on, like I was a freshman, I suppose. Uh, I joined this like mentorship program where uh, lower year students were paired up with like upper year students. And um, the person I would pair it up with, who's still a friend, I'm in touch with him, uh, really was eye-opening for me. He was like your so, mentor? Like, he was my mentor. Okay. Yeah, he was my mentor. He was like two years older than me. Um, I just like go in the meeting and I asked him, hey, who are you? What do you, what do you want to do after you graduate? And he's like, well, I'm going to go to law school. And um, I'm like, well, which ones do you have in mind? He's like, well, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, <laughs> Columbia. I'm ones. like, wait, you can do that here? Like any of us can do that here? is that a thing? He's like, yeah, why not? I, mean, I want to do it. I can do it. You can do it too. Um, so anyway, through talking to this person, I, I also found out that like he had come from a very disadvantaged background, wow. almost failed high school. His father That's had funny. like walked out on his mom. So he was raised by a single mother, him and two other siblings. Uh, and he had run-ins with the law. I'm like, if this person can do it and turn his life around, it's so confident. Well, I guess I could do it too. So that ran those random encounters with people like have changed me I, I understood that there is like a capability within me and that like upped my confidence and gave me a new understanding about my life and where I want to go mm-hmm. so that guy was very helpful um the third I want to say it's like one person but two people as I get older the more I think about this the more I realize like my, my parents were actually very like influential yes. in a very good way <laughs> and uh I think back as I get older I'm like wait what they taught me there and then or as a child, or the examples they gave me have been very, very useful. Mm-hmm. So I would say my parents, no doubt. Um, when we're immigrants, so we left Iran uh, when I was young, and they immigrated and didn't speak English well. When they came here, like their credentials were not accepted. So they had to start from scratch, all for their kids. And they persevered. And they eventually became very successful entrepreneurs. Um, what they, I guess, instilled with me was a sense that obviously hard work is important and pays off. Yes. But like perseverance is extremely important. There are so many obstacles my parents had to navigate in setting up their businesses, especially when you don't know how the business environment of this new country is, mm-hmm. how the business law operates, or even can't really communicate with your business associates and partners just because of that language barrier. Um, but that perseverance was something that they really, really gave to me. Um, and I would say like the importance of humility is very important. Uh, that my parents are not the type of people that would just like brag about how great their life is or show off their material possessions. That's not important to them. It's more about like, are you living a happy life, a fulfilling life? That's what they want. And they are don't you really describing my parents right now? Because that kind it's of amazing. Like that. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I mean, it's great that you have parents like that. And I can say that my parents influenced me in a really good way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like really understanding that the BS of life, if anybody were to give you that, just does not matter. Cancel it out and do your own thing. Follow, stick on your path. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I really appreciate that and they, those lessons that they gave me even though I didn't appreciate it as a child or teenager now as an adult I'm like wait that is extremely important and has made me who I am now in a very positive way I was waiting for you to say your parents I'm like he has <laughs> to say them like come on like, the found, that foundation is so important you know to be brought up yeah. on foundation of values and and making sure that they instill those in you like be a good person be humble work hard and you can have whatever you want and who better to give you that advice than people you saw come from nothing and show that that doesn't matter you work hard and you can have what you want and look at you you ended up at harvard law because someone was like wait you can do that too and you're like really thanks <laughs> and i would say i mean it is very important to have that uh, got that that family support mm-hmm. if it's not financial at least that emotional support moral support and I understand like a lot of people don't have it. Um, and that's like something I'm grateful for that I did have this. I like another thing. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I would say that another thing that I would say is also very important coming from my parents is that they were pretty tough. Like they weren't the type that would say like, oh, you're, you're such a great son just because you're our son. Like, nah, <laughs> you got to show us something. You got to do something like impressive for us to actually give you a compliment. Yeah. Um, so like they helped in not making me spoiled or complacent. Mm-hmm. Um, so if like their life was a hustle, they kind of convey that the way they're going to raise me is a bit of a hustle. Yeah. And I might not have liked that as a child. I might've complained many times that I don't want to do this or that, or I, I want the newest Game Boy. And they're like, no, you can't have that. <laughs> um, I, for example, I would, I remember like in my summers in like elementary school, a lot of times my parents would take me to work and they had, they had built this factory 
out of nothing. They had like wow. a factory they built that uh, produced office supplies That's for big companies thing. and government agencies. And so I would be just like chilling on like the production line next to the conveyor belt. And like when I was younger, they just like kept me there and babysat me. Um, <laughs> but I, I got to see people work. I got to see like yeah. how they manage things, uh, how I saw like the other staff people uh, work. And as I got a bit older, I was say like 12, they actually had me work there. Wow. And that was like really interesting for me. I didn't like it then because I'm like, I want to do other things. I'm like, why am I in like, I want to go into like the mall right now. I want to be like made up with my friends. Yeah. I'm like, you could do that later. But from nine to four or five, just chill with us for a bit. Yeah. Um, and I didn't like it back then, as I said, but like when I look back, I'm like, that is a great experience. Wow. If I didn't learn anything, obviously I didn't know how to like operate machinery or like design stuff, but at least I saw how people worked. I saw how coworkers interacted. I saw how managers manage things. Um, and I just saw how difficult it is to actually make money, how to make a business profitable. Yes. Um, so I also appreciate all of that as well that my parents did. Mm -hmm. I like that you also mentioned um, having a mentor because even if you don't come from, you know, parents who have a good foundation or your family's, you know, not perfect, um, which nobody's family is perfect, but um, it's important to find someone that can at least give you that push that you need to kind of make a decision and believe in yourself. Like a lot of times we have trouble believing in ourselves and a mentor can mm -hmm. really show you what you're capable of, that you can do anything you set your mind to. You just have to work hard for it. So totally. Yeah, I, love that yeah, I totally agree with you there. Mentors are just invaluable. Mm -hmm. And it kind of relates back to um, the legal industry in a way, but I would say like any advisory or even professional uh, profession sorry um when new associates come into those companies and firms they're typically paired off with a mentor now, this could be law this could be accounting this could be a consulting investment whatever mentorship that is like forced doesn't necessarily work because you might not drive with that person yeah and this is what i would say for like any mentorship not just like in any profession just in general if you're designing a mentorship program Odds are just because you pair somebody with somebody else, it might not work. It's those organic mentors that just pop out of nowhere. Now, I was lucky. The example I gave an undergrad, the person I was paired off with, we connected and I'm still friends with them. Yeah. But that's because there was something there between us, an organic bond that developed. And all the other scenarios where I've had a mentor or have wound up being someone's mentor, it was just like out of the blue. I just yeah. like met this person. They connect with me. I connect with them. If they would end up being my mentor, they notice that I have this both the potential, but also like I'm lacking in certain things and they're trying to build it up for me. And um, if I wind up becoming somebody's, men somebody's mentors and this, like, I don't even notice that I am until like two years later or three years later, they thank me. They're like, yo, those speeches that you gave us or those meetings you had with me, like really changed my life. I'm like, cool. I didn't expect that to happen. But it's, it's about be not just being in the right place at the right time, but connecting with someone and genuinely wanting to help them. Find not just like someone you click with yeah well you like click, but also genuinely because there's a lot of like mentorship programs where people are just like I, I have to fill this hour because this is what the program told me it doesn't work that way you has to be genuine and yes don't go in there necessarily with the goal of changing someone's life <laughs> yeah you don't know if that's going to work um but if it's more organic more laid back you don't know in two three ten years they're going to call you up or message you say thanking you and that makes all the difference for you it's very fulfilling, but of course for them because it changed their life. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that. That was super helpful. Um, so if you had to pick one thing that you think is an important personality trait or characteristic for someone to be successful in the legal industry, what would that strength or personality trait be? Like what does someone need in your opinion from what you've seen to be successful in the legal industry? There's something they need to work on. <laughs> uh, something they need to work on or have. So that's a bit different because uh, a lot of people who end in, in the legal industry have a skill mm -hmm. that they've developed through uh, law school and undergrad, and that's being able to work effectively while sleep deprived. So they don't need to work <laughs> on that. <laughs> They're already good at it, probably. Uh, but that's a very important skill for a lawyer <laughs> in general. <laughs> um, but something they need to develop. So, I mean, the, the stereotypical stuff like perseverance, attention to detail, obviously they need to develop it. They might already have it because their personality lent them towards law. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that necessarily, but something that I think will be very worthwhile to any lawyer and law students when they look back in 20 years, uh, and I guess they either are thankful that they had it or they wish they developed it, 
seeing the bigger picture. They don't necessarily see it. Uh, with lawyers, it's like, here's a document I'm drafting or reviewing. I have to see if every punctuation mark is in the right place. The right words are used. The right references are there. So you're really in the weeds. Yeah. And that becomes your life from one matter to the next, one project to the next. Mm-hmm. And that goes into your mind. Like You kind of manage your life like that. You manage your bit of the firm that way, the people who are underneath you. Um, and yeah, there's some downsides there. For one, you're kind of a micromanager, but also you don't see the bigger picture. You don't realize that maybe like 20 years from like have passed by in your career. And it's just been one project after the next that's defined the main milestones in your life. Not necessarily your time with your family uh, or your friends or your own personal development. And I think not just for any lawyer, but any person in general, if you hit middle age or you're elderly and you have this realization that you didn't really live a fulfilling life, it's kind of crushing. Yeah. Um, so I would just say to any lawyer or law student, please see the bigger picture. It's important to obviously uh, be have attention to detail and sometimes micromanage, but you really have to see the bigger picture. Yeah, I like that you brought that up because that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, you know, we're all about work-life balance. How can you create a better work-life balance? So what do you do to maintain this balance? Like, do you have any tips for lawyers who are struggling to step away from their computers? Because we all know they work too many hours. So how have you maintained a good work-life balance? Well, there's a presumption there that I have maintained a good work-life balance. <laughs> 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 well, I, can't say I hope I so. Have. Let's see how you do it. <laughs> I can't say I always have, and uh, but I wish I should. I, I had, and I'm striving to now. Okay, that's um, that that is important. So, like, I could say the typical stuff is just like, oh, unplug, uh, spend time with family and friends, or do this or do that, go out or go on a vacation. But the key thing is, it's you're kind of glued to your computer. Yeah. Not I, I it, it, even if like nobody's forcing you, you, for whatever reason you've turned into this workaholic, so you're gonna yeah. be attached to it. Yeah, that's not cool. Um, so my suggestion, um, or advice, I guess it would be change the culture. I, obviously, we'll be realistic here. One person on their own can't necessarily change the culture of a profession, or a firm, or an office. But you got to try at least. So if you're really burnt out um, and you need the time off or you can't juggle all these things, be very upfront about it. Yeah. Uh, let your colleagues know. Um, let somebody else know. Just communicate. So there, there is that. Um, you also have to understand, like, you're not superhuman. So if you have not really taken a break or work not like nonstop, like 80 hours a week for the past three months, yeah. that's not yeah. okay. That's not okay. And it's going to get to the point where even if you can continue working like that, you, what you're producing it won't be of high quality because you're sleep deprived, and anxious, stressed. You have no benefit to anyone, especially yourself. Yeah. So keep that in mind. When you do go into a leadership position, which eventually everybody, every lawyer or almost every lawyer will, like they will be more senior and have somebody that they're managing. Try to change things. Don't be that person who says, well, this is how I was treated. I'm going to treat everybody from this point onward the same way. That is not okay. It wasn't working then. Uh, I mean, if you look back at the legal profession, there's a lot of anxious people, a lot of burnout, a lot of people exiting, and a lot of, unfortunately, substance abuse. That's not cool. Like, the way we've been doing things up to now have led to this. So if you, in whatever authority you have, try to instill that work-life balance, however it may be, it will go a long way. And even if you have one person who you're managing, you're at least helping yourself and one other person and their family. So maybe that's like in total five or six people in general yeah. who are benefiting from this n- difference or new perspective that you're giving into the profession. Um, so that, that is what I would say. Like we've heard the stereotypes of like have ne- retreat or exercise yeah, uh, or watch a show. If you are anxious, if your work environment is hectic or toxic, doing any of those won't solve the problem. Yeah. So address it head on and address the issue. Yeah. So directly take a step back, look at what's going on, how you can improve your processes, how you can treat people better, how you can create a better work environment. So that that translates to your personal life as well. And you can have a more relaxed 
personal life and kind of step away from the computer and spend time and focus on what you love instead of consistently worrying about your work environment? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. And talk to people about it. Like if somebody really is the one triggering you and keeping you away from an assemblance of work-life balance, just address it. Let them know. Yeah. Uh, they might not change things, but at least you let them know. Uh, so they're that. on notice. It's important. They're yeah. on notice. <laughs> Uh, and I would say a, a note to law students, and we kind of talked about this, but every law student or almost every will end up being a lawyer at some point. Um, you got to have perseverance, but you also have to have perspective. So many law students go into law school thinking that they will graduate top of their class, do a law review, get a clerkship, work at the best firm out there, like top five in New York, um, and they'll they'll do it. But, but Three years in, they don't do it. You can't do all that. Yeah. It's, this, this is not how the profession is built. You can't do it. So if you haven't gotten there, that's okay. It's totally fine. Totally fine not to have been valedictorian or whatever else that, that term is used at any law school. It's totally fine to not work at like the top 10 firm in Manhattan. It, it's fine to work in a small law firm. That's totally okay. Why are you in this? Like, Is the legal profession really a competition? I thought you wanted to start a career because that's how you obviously want to make a living and you like it. Keep that in mind. Not that like I need to climb the, the top of the competition ladder. Um, the end of the day, it's like you're just burning yourself away and there's no real benefit. And I know this will fall on deaf ears. Let's be realistic. So in another generation of law students will go over the same expectations. Yeah, it's so important for law students to hear this, to know that they don't have to graduate and be at the top of everything, you know, because everyone obviously has that desire and thinks that this is the way I need to go. But it's okay to take things at your pace and learn and figure out what you like and then kind of go into that space with that knowledge and not just be so overwhelmed with everything that your life is terrible <laughs> you're absolutely accurate enjoy your that's career. totally correct enjoy your career enjoy your time in school um and I, something that i don't think a lot of lawyers understand until later in their career like really understand the importance of connections and networking so if you spend all of law school and all of your first year uh first years in the legal profession just constantly working who like what time do you have to meet people and those people could be future clients which is great if you can bring them in, they could have with them uh, the ability or to give you an opportunity for a career exit or your next career move, which is very invaluable. Yeah, they have hands-on experience experience that you don't have that they can provide that's more valuable than reading a textbook, you know? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. They could be your, a a new next best friend that can help you when you're stressed um, or just make your life better. You don't know. Uh, so I would tell every law student, do not forget the importance of networking, but not just networking sounds very transactional. Obviously, it's important, but also just like meeting people. That is just so important for your career, for your future, for your life in general. Don't discount that. Yeah, that has all been such great insight for law students. Um, I hope they all listen to this. They could definitely benefit from listening to you um, explain all of this. So going into um, legal tech a little bit, you have Mm -hmm. worked as a legal tech consultant. So how important do you think it is it for attorneys to hire a legal tech consultant to find the right technology for them? What can they what can they benefit from going through that process? Yeah, good question. Uh, I would say it is pretty important for a few reasons. Um, the basic one that we, we all like mention it every so often is like lawyers aren't really the most proficient at technology, so they, they might need like a, somebody else's perspective to help them and in, information. But that that's all that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's so much technology out there, so many different types of legal tech platforms, but also like non-specific legal tech that's also very important to the legal profession. That a lawyer who obviously has their own practice or is working in somebody else's practice, just doesn't have the time to keep abreast with. Mm -hmm. So you need an expert to just let you know what the options are. Um, Another aspect, I would say like why this is important. Lawyers obviously know their profession very well, but what they kind of lack is an understanding that the profession is actually a business. And like any business, it has revenue, it has costs, it needs to make profits. And there's a need for business development a need to streamline operations. A lot of lawyers dread that. They're like, we bill by the hour, so why should we be more efficient? Yeah. 
Well, no, here's the thing. If you're more efficient, you can do more revenue generating tasks as opposed to like the really redundant stuff, which I don't think any client really wants to pay for. Mm -hmm. And if they see it on your bill, that's what they're going to ask for a discount on. Um, So if you get a consultant or a legal ops person, uh, that's also very important. They can bring a business perspective as well uh, when it comes to acquiring legal tech, but also managing your ecosystem of technologies. And if you have legal ops, just managing the operations of the law firm or the legal department of, say, if you're in-house. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like very invaluable. Um, another aspect, I would say, and it relates to everything I said, legal tech and legal ops, there's a strategy involved. There's a plan, a rubric that you have to make. And if you're just a bunch of lawyers and sometimes paralegals, who have been tasked with their limited time to actually create the operations of your firm, including technology, you're not going to do it well. You don't know how to do it and you don't have enough time. Bring an outside perspective. Get that consultant, get that legal ops person to help you out. Yeah. If anything, when we constantly mention this in general, when it comes to other professions, diversity is important. Diversity is important for many reasons. One of them being gives you new perspectives Mm -hmm. and an understanding of things that you can do differently that you wouldn't know and maybe better. So bring on those legal consultants, utilize their background expertise, because realistically, yours is great, but it's kind of lacking in certain spheres. And they will augment that. And together, you can make a very powerful firm or an in-house office. So find someone who has done the research for you. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this is obvious. Like, if this was a company... Uh, they would say like, we don't have expertise in necessarily this next big project that we're doing. So let's hire some consultants. Yeah. And that's a whole industry by itself. And no one really doubts that they kind of do, but they don't. It's like by default, you know, you have to do this. Yeah. Why is it that it's kind of hard for lawyers to understand this? <laughs> Bring in the experts, collaborate with them, and it's going to be mutually beneficial. Yeah, that's that's been so great, Cheyenne. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, thank you for all the advice you offered, all the insight. I'm super grateful that you came on here and, you know, taught all of these tips on how you got through law school for other students who are going through the same thing. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Anything new in your future that we can look out for? Do you have any projects that you're currently working on? Uh, yeah, what am I look, working on? Well, once I know, I'll let you know what my next big thing <laughs> is, because I'm not sure. I'm actively searching <laughs> okay. uh, for opportunities. Uh, But something I am working on that is legal and legal tech related, I am on the editorial board of the legal uh, tech blog. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's like just a hobby that I'm doing. Uh, I I met this is like one of those random like uh, pandemic connections you make during lockdown. So it's Uh, legal tech blog. Yes, uh, it is legal tech. blog. Yes, um, I will give you the link (laughs) if you would like. Um, And there's some random people I met through like LinkedIn or maybe Twitter. I'm not even sure. And uh, they're based in Germany and they're like, we have this blog and we just talk and I wound up on the editorial board. It's just like a, a volunteer thing I do, but we do publish interesting articles about legal tech, its developments, mm-hmm. um, new startups, uh, new technologies. So definitely worth a read, um, including soon to come on a article about Locust. <laughs> Oh, very excited to see that. (laughs) So where can people find you if they want to reach out to you, if they want to work with you? Um, Is LinkedIn the best way to contact you? Uh, LinkedIn is the best way to contact me. Uh, I am there. It's just my name, Shayan Adelati. And it says I'm a JD. So if there's any other Shayan that is out there, that's not me. Just look for the guy (laughs) who has a JD in his handle. Perfect. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm the yeah, right we'll guy. Definitely put your LinkedIn um, profile link down below yeah. so everyone can sure. check out your profile and see what you're working on. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for coming on, Cheyenne. It was such a pleasure. No problem. To have you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. I really appreciate this time. And yeah, if anybody has any questions or wants to chat with me, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Cheyenne. Let's talk soon. Sure. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye bye.